We are live. Wow, we're live. Great. So, first, I'm looking at the producers offline. Good, thumbs up. Great, we're live. Okay, everyone. So, here we are. Um, welcome to this very first Striver now. My name is Garen Goodman. I'm a partner here at Striver. We are a venture builder. We build companies for other people. We also build them for ourselves. More about that on our website. I'm joined here tonight by three very interesting people to talk about the future of food, okay? Um, specifically tonight, we're gonna to be talking about meat and all the new variations of meat that are coming out. Um, on my right, your left, on my right here, we have Freya. Freya, and on my left, we have David. And then you should be able to see Dan. Dan, can you wave? Fantastic, okay. Um, and they'd like to quickly introduce themselves. So please, Dan, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a pleasure to be here. My name is Dan Leuning. I'm the CTO of Meatable. Uh, what we do at Meatable is we try, we are making meat without the need of using an animal ever again, using the fundamental components of life, the cells of the animal, to create delicious, real meat uh, without ever uh, slaughtering an animal ever again. Fantastic. Free. Hey everyone, my name is Priya Mehta. I work here at the New York. Um, my background's in chemical engineering and molecular biology, and I got my start in culture meat, the same fields where Donna's company is running, um, in a group that was responsible for making the world's first uh, cultured hamburger in 2013. Hi, um, everybody. Uh, my name is David Walker, I'm the founder of Boonian. Uh, we deliver delicious plant-based meal items to um, various food services, so the focus on catering, canteens, uh, restaurants, and large-scale uh, food service companies. Um, we um, make going meatless for a meal uh, incredibly simple and highly enjoyable. Great. So thanks, uh, Dan, David, and Freya. Um, this is going to be a um, really interesting session. Um, I'd just like to say that um, we will be taking questions at the end. Um, so please wait until then. Um, you'll be able to post questions. Nico's nodding at me, so it's my thank you. Um, and um, please, uh, we will share the LinkedIn profiles of our guests tonight so you can connect with them if you want to carry on the discussion. Um, I would like to say one thing uh, before we start, and that is, and otherwise I'll forget, and that is, Big thanks to Mo and Nico, production team, and to any of the Strivorgs tonight who have helped organize this, including agreeing to my complete change of the way this looks. Um, I got a desk. Um, thanks very much. Thanks to all the Strivorgs. Thanks for everyone involved to make this possible tonight. Okay, let's move on. Good, so agenda slide. Um, tonight we're gonna hear from uh, David, um, Freya, and Dan, um, and then they're gonna discuss among themselves. Uh, then we're gonna move on to the future of food and look at some data because Striver is all about data and a lot of hard work has gone into um, creating important data um, that gives us a really clear look at the market and what's going on. Um, and then we're gonna move on to a Q and A with the audience. Okay, next slide. No, next slide, great, okay. So. Meat. Where are we with meat at the moment? So you can see the numbers on the screen. I'm not going to repeat them. Um, there is definitely a problem on planet Earth with meat. Um, there are simply too many of us, and we're um, eating too many animals. Um, tonight, we really want to talk about um, disruption. So um, what startups are going to be the most disruptive? Um, what kind of disruption is going to, going to happen because of the situation? Uh, what shifts will we see in the value chain? Okay, so it's not only about um, the poor animals, it's also, and the consumers, it's also about um, the companies that um, uh, produce and sell this, okay? Packaging, uh, for instance. Value chain for meat is huge. Uh, then we're gonna, um, we need to understand who's gonna benefit the most, okay? So massive disruption. Who's coming out of this as a winner? Who's coming out as losers? Okay, uh, current meat producers 
should be nervous about what's going on at the moment. Um, there needs to be change. And let's face it, if the, the incumbents don't change um, with the times, then there's going to be some problems for them. Uh, so what are the strategies of those companies which are affected? Um, we're going to talk about that tonight as well. And finally, something that's not on the screen that I really want to mention from my heart, because I'm that kind of guy. Um, what is the pain and suffering equation? It's not a number yet. It's not, it hasn't been calculated yet, but animals are sentient beings um, and they do feel pain. And that pain has a number. Um, my daughters don't eat meat, not because it's not good for them, because they don't like the suffering it causes. And they're not the only young women on this planet who feel like that. I think billions of others will as well. So that's a massive equation that hasn't been created yet. Maybe it's something Striver should do. The pain and suffering equation, what is that? And I think that will come out tonight. So let's move on to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to hear now from our guests. Um, we want to know, um, I want to know a few things from you guys. Um, I want to know about your motivation. Um, I want to know about the support that you got, um, particularly Dan in the case of VCs and public bodies. Um, I want to know about um, the increase in demand um, and how are consumers being educated. And then I also want to know about um, the biggest challenge in starting. So who would like to go first? Dan, you're the furthest away from us over there in Leiden. Um, would you like to go first? Yeah, so oh, there's, a, there's a lot there, right? Which question do you want me to address first? So why don't you talk about your motivation? What, what got you started in the first place? Yeah, that's, very, that's a very great question. Thank you for that. So I'm actually trained as a uh, molecular cell biologist and tissue engineer. So this is a very up and coming field in mainstream science where they are using the body's own cells to create damaged, uh, to replace damaged tissues. Uh, so what, if you're using the patient's own cells, there will be no rejection of that specific part of, of that tissue. But you can completely reframe that research and if you change the species into a cow or a pig you can use the same methodologies and the same fundamental science to create food that we all love namely meat but without ever using an animal and this is where i started my journey as a, as a scientist as a molecular biologist but soon uh, figured out that my experience and my knowledge could be repurposed for what i believe is a is a bigger goal uh, bigger than myself uh, actually what the world also need uh, so like Freya, I also joined the group of Mark Post in the Netherlands a little bit earlier uh, when uh, we were still working on producing the first laboratory grown hamburger. And during that development, I found methods and ways where I could see potential for commercialization. And through my journey, found other people who want to join me on this journey and uh, founded a company around this technology. And what I'm really hoping is that I can fundamentally reduce suffering in the world. You just talked about like the pain scale, and this is also can be translated into suffering. But not only animals that suffer, but also people in the system. Uh, I think in the States, there has been reports of people in slaughterhouses getting large outbreaks of COVID. Even here in the Netherlands, there has been cases uh, where people uh, are in very poor working conditions in these slaughterhouses, contract COVID at a much uh, faster rate than normal people. So it's the entire system that I want to change by reducing the suffering overall uh, by using my background and my knowledge to create good for the world how do you um how did you get support from this um what was the way that you sold this story that you've just given us to vcs or to other stakeholders potential stakeholders well i don't i don't think it's i think the time when, when i maybe let's go back a little bit when i started this it was a extremely nascent field nobody knew about cultured meat i have a great example for the moment that i actually joined the lab in uh, mark's lab that i told my mother and she asked me can't you find a real job and that was a moment like ma this is a real job I, this is something that actually has to be done i can see the i can see this changing the world and of course after that she supported me uh, but something happened in between 2013 and today uh, where there was a huge mind shift in the way that we perceive agriculture as being one of the main drivers of climate change, which was a very unique change in mindset, which I didn't expect it because a lot of people were already explaining that cows were a big contributor of methane, uh, the way that we are using land and crops. 
uh, to feed these animals uh, is not very uh, efficient. And something over, it's, it's felt to me like overnight, change the mindset of people saying, ah, we need to do something about this. It's not only energy that's contributing a lot to global, uh, global warming, but it's also the agricultural industry. And at the beginning of that wave, uh, I found a, a team of people that had unique skill set where we were going around to VC, uh, world in Europe, and then this was brewing, and we were just at the right time for these people to uh, to entice them with a unique angle of solutions that we're providing to to make this technology commercial uh, viable. And that was the moment that we were lucky enough to find uh, common ground with these people to support us uh, in our journey. Do you um? We're going to look at some numbers later about your um, particular approach, um, but. How do you see increase in demand? I mean, is this, is what you're doing, you're very passionate and very um, convinced by what you're doing, but are you seeing that reflected out there in the marketplace? So it, it's, it's a, what you can do is a thought experiment, which I always tell myself when I'm, I'm thinking about this, is, is that if I would have two hamburgers right now in front of you, and one would be from a slaughtered animal that had high carbon emissions, high methane emissions, a lot of water and resources was going into that hamburger. And the one next to it didn't have any of that. It was producing without killing an animal, much less resources needed in total. And what I would do is I would switch them around behind my back and I put them back on the table and I will, I will ask you which one is which. And as soon as you cannot tell me which one is which anymore, I, I'm very skeptical and believing there will still be an argument for people to choosing the animal or original traditional meat over the meat that I will be providing. Uh, and on that basis, I, I'm a firm believer that as soon as we can create such a product, that it would not be very hard for people to convince people to to try at least this product. And as soon as they experience, keep them uh, keep them in the loop and keep them buying this product since meat is still one of the biggest, um, incre there's biggest increase in animal protein around the world. Yeah. Um, finally, um, you got started, but what was your biggest challenge as an entrepreneur? I mean, getting out of bed in the morning, every morning, were you bootstrapped? Um, were you still working out of a garage? I mean, what, what was the challenge you faced? Forget about the meat, just talk about how was it to start a business? Yeah, that, that's. If I look back to it, I'm still. Get, I'm, I'm, I get a little bit nervous since I was never trained to be an entrepreneur. I was trained to be an independent scientist. I was trained to be in a lab and and explore and and do research in a in a constructive academic manner or to produce papers. And suddenly you're pushed in front of these investors and you have to tell the story to how you're going to change the world. And that was in the beginning very uncomfortable. Uh, the fun thing that you mentioned about a garage, I'm sitting now, I had to go home since um, I had to take care of my cat since my uh, fiance is at the door at the moment, uh, that I'm sitting in my laundry room. And this was the place where I actually started with my co-founder. We were making plans here. We are doing our first calls here. So there's still, there's still a little bit of laundry right over there. So it's nothing much changed. Only now I have an office uh, in Delft in the Netherlands where I do my work. But this is really ground zero where we started from. And getting like really grimy, getting you know, six o'clock in the morning, waking up, taking a plane to London, doing six, seven investor conversations and like 11 at night, getting the plane back, being completely exhausted and doing the same story over and over again and finding people that actually want to want to uh, partake in the, in the story, which is uh, it's not easy. It is not easy. But I always tell myself it was easy. More people would have been doing it. Absolutely. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And whilst you're on, I just wanted to big shout out to Jonah from Blue Yard for telling me to put you on last Saturday at dinner, Soho House in Berlin. Thanks a lot, Jonah. Nice one. Freya, can we talk about what you do? Of course. Yeah. Um, what got you started? What was your motivation? I mean, what was behind hard slog? This is tough, tough science, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, very similar to what, is this the pitch part already? Okay, great. So yeah. uh, just very quickly, very similar to what Dan already mentioned. Yeah. Um, we have a pretty similar educational background. And I also was sort of thinking, what are the big challenges that, that are facing the world? And as a biologist, you're oftentimes really focused on, on the, the, small, the smallest you know, pieces of life. You're always looking sure. down on a very low, small scale. And it can be difficult to imagine how you can contribute to these like, huge juggernautic problems like climate change or animal suffering or people suffering when you're trained in something that is so 
essentially minute. Mm -hmm. And so for me, cultured meat was a really, um, was kind of the only application that, that struck me as one that I could contribute to meaningfully that would have, you know, large scale potential for change. So that was sort of the motivation. And then I basically got incredibly, incredibly lucky, got a chance to work in the group where Donald's about to start in Maastricht. Mm -hmm. um, I was working on fat tissue engineering and it really sort of introduced me to the field and the players in the community and it um, has helped guide my decisions for the future. So at the moment I'm looking to start um, some more sort of fundamental research projects that go in this direction because in addition to a very like diverse startup scene mm -hmm. in, in the direction of culture meat, we still have a lot of fundamental biological questions remaining before this technology is going to be sort of available for, for large scale. And I think a lot of that work needs to be done in synergy with public institutions as well. So that's sure. sort of my, my goal is to um, bring in these biomedical researchers who are doing really analogous work and have been for, for decades mm -hmm. to this application and sort of have that same mindset switch that occurred for me and for Don and for other people in our field um, and, and sort of widen the people who are experiencing that sure. switch. Would you like to show your slides? Should yeah, sure. Out the slides, guys? Sure. So just, just right. quickly, so I wanted to, I guess, describe a little bit more cultured meat to you guys and the motivation behind it. So a lot of the problems inherent in current food production come from the fact that animals are fundamentally inefficient converters of resources to food. This is because if we think about industrial animal agriculture, we're really treating the animal as a meat machine. But the problem is it's an incredibly inefficient machine. In just one parameter, the one that's shown here, um, which is, uh, so it's sort of feed input compared to the meat output. Um, even after, you know, thousands of years of domestication and breeding programs, a cow still will only give you about 11% beef compared to the feed that went in. And that's just considering the feed, not even considering the water, the land, the energy and the risk associated with it, not even considering the opportunity cost of resources as well. So, um, like why, why is the animal actually so inefficient? And it's because this machine, this animal, um, is producing meat as a byproduct of its own existence. It's using all that energy to run its brain, its, you know, its organ systems, its hooves, its scales, all of this stuff, which is totally irrelevant for food production, um, but is incredibly relevant for the animal to exist. So the idea behind cultured meat, as Dan was mentioning, is that you just take, if you strip away all these inefficiencies that come from the rest of the animal, mm -hmm. you can end up producing just the part that we're interested in, in making. And the reason we're able to even entertain this idea is because we're standing on over 150 years of biomedical research, where we're taking exactly as Dan was mentioning, cells from animals and organisms of humans, bringing them into a laboratory environment, sort of tricking them into thinking that they're in the original environment where they were from, mm -hmm. um, by giving them nutrients and environmental cues that allow them to think so. And then uh, if they're growing in a laboratory environment, we can sort of uh, ask specific questions about what they're doing. We can produce them without the entire organism. And so this, uh, this is sort of the basis of of culture and technology. You have to tell them to put the next slide up. Yeah, yeah you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so since this original hamburger that occurred in 2013 from Mark Post's group in Maastricht University, which was a combination of public and private funds, uh, there's been about 40 companies that have emerged, so startups, in the cultured meat space. Um, most of them are B2C, so they want to produce direct -to consumer products. Many are also B2B, so they want to produce stuff that other companies can integrate into their food products and market. Um, about 375 million US dollars has been invested just in this startup space so far. The majority of that is from venture capital. And the reason I'm showing you this slide is because two things are really striking. One is this number, 375 million US dollars cumulatively. Sounds like a big number, right? But when you consider the fact that the entire meat production at the moment is on the order of 1 trillion US dollars, mm. it's really, really paltry. And this is a huge increase that we've seen in just five Not years. Not paltry. Huh? Paltry. It's very poultry. Yeah. And <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. No, 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 no. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's a webinar, right? I mean, it's five webinar. It's definitely. Um, yeah, but we'll see a huge amount of growth, which is which is really exciting because I think, as we mentioned, the potential for um, cultural meat is is huge. If you go to the next slide, um, these are some prototypes mm. from just four companies in the space who have Creative Commons licenses on their photographs, so we can get to use them in this setting. So thanks mm. a lot. Um, and the thing about plant-based meat alternatives is that they're really in an amazing way trending towards authenticity um, in, in terms of replicating the experience of, of eating an animal product. The sensory experience is starting to be very spot on for certain products. But the difference is that 
cultured meat could in theory be exactly the same, exactly the same in every way as the meat that you would get from an animal. Um, and this advantage also comes with huge challenges because it is you know, quite a lot of science that's remaining to be understood before we can produce these prototypes at large scale. Um, and, but, but another important thing to remember is that with this challenge comes huge opportunity because remembering that this is connected to the biomedical field, the breakthroughs and the development that will go into um, sort of mobilizing and enabling culture meat in a large way is going to be the same breakthroughs that are going mm -hmm. to allow us to progress hugely in biomedical research. You know, if you want to build a piece of muscle that you can eat or you want to build an organ that you can implant into a patient, it's fundamentally the same technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why uh, it's sort of an investment in not just food, but also in a much larger suite of really important applications mm -hmm. if we start to consider what cultured meat sort of is, is built upon. Sure. I think we've got another slide there. That was it. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Good. David. 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 Thank you for coming tonight, sir. It's glad to see you again. Um, why don't you talk about Boolean? I mean, I, I know your motivation. Um, but I think you should tell, tell people what your motivation is. Yeah, um, I was, uh, it started in 2012. I was um, in the process of opening a restaurant and began research on all of my purveyors, checking out their supply chain. And also have made um, a, now a, um, which became a very important decision in my life was to um, check out the, the slaughtering uh, I guess standards and the situation by uh, the different deliverers of pork or beef or chicken or duck. And um, so I went to visit these uh, slaughterhouses and I mean, keep in mind, these are like small slaughterhouses, nothing on the scale of industrialized, nothing that evil, you know, these are like farmers that are raising, you know, 10 cows or whatever, and still bring them to their local slaughterhouse. Um, but I still I just wasn't prepared for, uh, for what I experienced. And um, it had a profound effect on me. And so um, that pretty much ruined my concept of opening this restaurant. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so I started um, searching, you know, um, to find meat alternatives because I, you know, I come from the Midwest in the States and you grow up on meat and potatoes and, you know, and hunting and that type of thing. So, um, and so I started looking and, you know, like, let's say, guys, can we go to the slide? So this is just an example of in 2012, this would be like a Bavarian restaurant and this was the vegetarian um, um, <laughs> yeah. and so this is sort of what I was dealing with in 2012 that's all right thanks um, and uh, sorry was the schwein filet medallions the vegetarian option yeah okay yeah so, so you had a smoked but actually the... actually this sorry. is this is like a future menu this is like just go menu. back to that slide again, go back. this is like a menu in 10 years maybe you know this would be like the perfect there's there's uh cultivated uh um, salmon there there's <laughs> cultivated pork this is like i guess it was like a very um you know it's like a, uh, they were they imagining were ahead of their time yeah. yeah they're imagining the future yeah yeah so without being able to do bavaria and Gritz house they were way ahead of their time now so um yeah, and so I, I just was trying to find for my own personal consumption um, products that gave me the satisfaction of, mm. of eating meat, it was flavor, it was, um, mouth feel, taste, bite. Um, and in 2012, there was at least in Germany, there was almost nothing on the market that was enjoyable. Uh, so I, as always, when I'm confronted with the problem, um, I solve it, and try to solve it myself. And so I experimented for about a year, uh, took a year uh, and focused on, on this and it was just every day in the kitchen, experimenting, uh, cooking, working with different uh, raw materials, different recipes, trying to find the right blends of acidity and spice, and, uh, protein. And, um, and so after, after a year, it just, I got more involved and it just, became, well, maybe I should turn this into a business idea instead of like a 
selfish endeavor just to make myself happy and um, to, to have an alternative to meat products. Uh, so um, I started thinking more, maybe some other people would be interested in this. And so um, started um, doing some research, giving out some samples. And there was a small amount of, um, in, in Munich at least, a small amount of um, uh, interest in this. And still, most of the time you were just looked at like you're a crazy person. And um, this is Bavaria, you know, and um, you know, this like um, not drinking beer, I guess, if you're not eating meat in Bavaria. Um, and, um, but I, I continued with that. And, um, and now, you know, that was in 2012. We've developed a consistent um, customer base. We don't do any advertising. We don't do spend any time with uh, with uh, customer acquisition, anything like that. It's mostly try it, and they try it, and they usually order it. And um, yeah, and so that's you know the goal for them was just <laughs> the goal <laughs> was to uh, all right something cool's <laughs> about to happen. Uh, okay, this is great. Right. Thank you, thank you, producers, for making this happen. Yeah, Christine, it's lovely okay. to see you. Yeah, yeah, this is very risky. risky. This is extremely risky, so that's what we do at Strider. We're not scared. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Right, we should all take a fork. It smells really good. Individually, COVID style, so like, let's not yeah. affect each other. Um, let's put this thing somehow in the middle. So this is Boolean food, right? I mean, it would be insane to do this without having some food on the table. David, tell us, what have we got here? Well, this is a spicy uh, chipotle lime uh, strips or medallions. Um, I decided to, to make the products with a little bit of a, a kick in them, um, just because um, I guess it was my American upbringing that we like things a little spicier. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, and so this has now sort of become the classic. I don't know how uh, the team prepared this, but, um, uh, and, the basic idea is that you can open the package and without any experience of being a cook or um, uh, um, you're able to just have an enjoyable um, meal or part of your meal um, that, um, yeah, is, uh, it tastes good. Um, so brilliant. It's good for the yeah. planet. It's good for the animals. I mean, it's a win-win for everybody. I've been, so, I've been told to speed you up. We've got to stop the boonie in advertising now. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're into trouble. Okay, so there are some um, very large food companies watching this right now. Interested in Boonian? Here's your man. Um, I'm just going to have another piece. Um, we now need to move on to some data. Producers, what have we got on the screen? Mm, this is great. If we tuck in. <laughs> so, um, where are we now? Free knows these numbers really well. So, right now, um, meat consumption. Um, 1.2 trillion, 1.2 trillion. So that's everything in the value chain, um, doing it, packaging it, delivering it, everything, selling it. Um, but by 2040, in 20 years time, based on the number of people on the planet, it's gonna be 1.8 trillion, okay? Um, so I've got some questions about this for um, Dan and David. Um, Dan, your potential business um, in 20 years' time could make you a very, very rich man. Would you like to comment? Uh, <laughs> well, it, it is always uh, it's always nice that uh, that you can make a living out of what you're doing. Um, I think that we won't be the sole heir of this entire market, so there will be, as you can see for yourself, plenty of room for more. And this is just also, this is only meat, right? So there are companies are doing shrimp, they're doing fish, all sorts of fish. So I think even this is an under underestimation of the complete cultured meat um, contribution to the entire food chain. And I think it's great that there is, uh, I don't think if there wouldn't be any money to be made here that uh, VCs would be interested in this. So showing these numbers to VCs, showing that there is a return, showing that this is actually, that food is a pretty profitable market. It's not only software or all the and apps, it is really also food that can be very profitable and that if they, they step in now and they help us bring this into reality, they can also make a, a nice buck at the side. Yeah, um, 
Do you see the potential that until tw in 2030, in 10 years, 10% of glo global meat revenue will be from cultured meat, Dan's product, really? I mean, it's, it's really difficult to, to make predictions, especially quantifiable ones like this, uh, because the market is so immature. I mean, there are definitely companies that plan to have products out in the next couple of years. Um, but this question of how much market share can you expect, I really personally don't feel well equipped to answer. I think it's a really difficult question to answer because you can't necessarily easily predict not only the progress needs to occur technically before you can release products and scale them, but also regulatory changes in specific markets that could be very high impact. Um, it's difficult to predict consumer behavior. You only need, you need, you know, one great marketing campaign or one great marketing sort of blunder to dramatically change how things end up working out. So I think, to be quite honest, from my perspective, I think it's difficult to to nail down a number there. But mm. that all being said, I think that there are some companies with some really exciting uh, progress right now, working on pilot plants to produce sure. their, their product in, in larger scale. And hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll start to see those products actually on the market, uh, along with plant-based meat alternatives, which are already quite ubiquitous. From your experience, David, um, um, vegan replacements um, have grown over the last few years. Do you, do you see a, you see a now a threat from cultured meat? I mean, is Dan a competitor or, or is Dan a complement? Are you pioneering what Dan wants to perfect? Oh uh, well, I, I, I don't think you know. Within the next few years, I don't think it's there's um, in my price segment. You know, anything um, like a competition with with cultivated meat. Um, but even if it was, I would still welcome it. Um, anything that contributes to um, to reducing the amount of um, pain and suffering and the wasted resources um, is, is is welcome. And so, even if even if it was competition, I would, I would probably. Yeah, and, and and if I could add to that. It, it is. I think you're underestimating the problem here. That I don't think cultured meat is a silver bullet that's going to save us all. It is. We have to do everything. We have to eat more plants. We have to just eat less meat. We have to have alternatives like cultured meat. And I just think cultured meat is a it can be a big player to help us through this protein transition. But we have to do a more holistic view as a whole to make this um, feasible. Make make us go to the next century of prosperity as a human species. Definitely, I, I think it's it's a it's a mindset and it's a complete uh, diet uh, rethinking. I mean, um, there's uh, I have to admit I don't eat that many meat alternatives. Um, you know, um, it's part of my daily diet. There's so many other things that, that you can where you can get your protein from. Um, but once in a while, it's a sort of a comfort food for me and um, sort of a flashback, so I enjoy it. But I, I agree, it's a, it's a mindset. Um, change that, that needs to happen. Sure. So let's look at the next slide, guys. I'm just conscious of time. Um, I'm doing good? Fine. Um, so, which meat alternatives ha has the biggest commercial potential, right? So, cultured meat has, has the biggest commercial potential, but yet little funding. Um, Dan, you need to talk about that in a minute, um, which is needed for reaching mass market. So, cheaper to production, uh, more interesting for major companies, but needs technological advancements. And then demand. So mindset versus cost. Will mass market consumers be willing to pay more for their good feeling? Um, Freya, maybe you could kick that off. How close will cultured meat be to a conventional meat regarding taste and feel? Um, do you see a big potential there? Or could it be a blocker that customers don't accept? Uh, so sort of two things. The first question is, how analogous, basically, to the community, as you understand it, can we get? I think the goal for everyone is to be indistinguishable. But this becomes then like a food science and an engineering problem um, where you can sort of introduce customizability to make sure that your product matches whatever you're, whatever you're going for. And I think there's really a lot of potential here, and this is why the culture of meat technology is exciting, because it offers us the chance to really become, to really present exactly what we're used to eating, sort of culturally and historically. Um, with maybe less effort than you would need from the food science perspective from you know, making meat analogs from plants. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question, sorry. Second question is really, um, what's, the, what, what's the big potential there? Or could it be a blocker that customers uh, don't accept? 
Okay, yeah, so consumer, yeah. consumer acceptance is a big like topic in this field. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's sort of a lot of interesting studies that are already starting to show us how people are responding. So a great one that, that I like to cite that also came out of the group that Dan and I both, both worked in, which was a psychological study um, done by Natalie Roland, um, where a set of over 200 uh, participants in the study were presented an actual piece of burger. And in reality, it was just a normal burger from the, the store. Uh, but they were told that it was a cultured burger. And they have a small piece, you know, because so it's expensive. small. It's, yeah, it's a small production, so here's yes. a small piece of meat. And so normally when, when surveys are done about consumer awareness, they're simply surveys, so it's hypothetical. So you're really, you can you can be um, a bit dishonest, basically. You're not even, you don't even know yourself, right, if you would want to try this product or not. But in this study, 100% of the participants tried the piece of meat that was put in front of them, and they were told that it was cultured meat. I think this is a really interesting thing to, to think about. And also what Don was mentioning is a thought experiment where if you have the option to try something that is functionally identical, why wouldn't you? And another fascinating part of the, the study was that they also included a question, how much would you be willing to pay for this product? So they were able to try it and then they were told, okay, let's say that this product costs one euro. How much would you be willing to pay to have the exact same product that you just eaten? Um, so, Conventional burger costs one euro, and they were willing to pay one euro and thirty-five cents. Mm -hmm. So a thirty-five percent increase over the cost of conventional meat. And it's only one study, of course, and it's the it's one out of many, and there will be many more in the future. But I think in general, things tend to bode very well for consumer acceptance for this product. Mm -hmm. David, um, this is good, right? You know I like this anyway. So how close can you get to the actual meat taste with vegan alternatives? Um, I mean, you, you're close, right? But, um, and then what's your top selling product? So what do people really like? Well, I mean, we don't, we're not trying to, um, to get exactly to the taste of meat itself. It's mostly about mouth feel and flavor. We make, the items are, are not just a simple, like a chicken or beef or pork. It's actually a, a, a finished meal item. Um, and so um, it's not, we're not really so focused on that, on like the raw material like uh, cultivated meats are. Um, so um, it's a completely different, uh, different uh, subject. So it doesn't matter? No. Okay, interesting. Great, let's move to the next slide, guys. So uh, what's hot for investors versus entrepreneurs? Okay, Dan. Uh, the share of food science startups has risen sharply while delivery is still dominating investments by a large proportion. Delivery being something I know as the first ever investor in Fundora. Um, so, uh, questions. Um, Dan, reactions from investors in this field. Um, change of mindset for the investors. Was it hard to convince investors? 5% um, of investment versus 36% of startups created with food science so just talk about investors for us i mean you how many here's a question how many pitches did you do before you got your first round oof that's a, <laughs> that might be a little uncomfortable question um i, I stopped counting after 100 i think it's it, it, it was a lot because it was so early in the cycle right now it's becoming more mainstream people are getting fomo there's more capital available for these ideas but what you should realize is that we've been classified as a category called deep tech while as a food science startup product to market is one two years but we have a longer developmental track to get production up to start building a private plan to start building factories where we'll then we'll probably reach commercial skills um, and also cost competitive pricing uh, before we actually will enter to the market and it's also uh, what's considered a novel food where also a regulatory aspect will come into place. Com uh, getting this combined will you will have to find investors that are pretty comfortable with a long uh, over to a long return time and also that they can see the promise that even though you know you have to have development in place they can see the end of the tunnel so that makes it a, a quite a difficult idea to sell you're you're combining a world of food with the world of biology and those two don't usually mix very well together 
Uh, but right now we're trying that. And so far we have been successful in that, but I can see that, that the hurdle for entry for uh, startups might be bigger if you don't have something unique, you don't have something special where you can say you can, you can lever to get your product faster to market, that you can make a cheaper, uh, better, tastier alternative. So that is really what you, what you have to have to, to be a player in this field. Uh, producers, can we put that slide back up, please? Because I think that's really useful for anyone listening to these answers. Thank you. Um, Freya, um, are you in contact with VCs and investors? Is that something that you do? Uh, no, I'm, I'm really not, because I'm really trying to come at this from the uh, established biomedical research community. Right. And, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of, you know, you still have to make this pitch, right? Yeah. But you're pitching something different. You're pitching rather, ask, rather than asking for money and financial support, you're asking for this, I guess, as well as the time and space to take the resources that are already being put to use for biomedical research and apply those to a really analogous but slightly different application, which is food. Sure. Uh, you were in Mark Post's lab, yeah? Yeah, we both were, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's a coincidence, by the way, yeah. that you're, you're on tonight. Okay. Um, perhaps also it's indicative of the um, small world. That you guys are there in. Oh, definitely. I think it's yeah. really important to consider. I mean, we're, this is getting a lot of traction right now, a lot of media attention, but it's a, a small field uh, and a small community of people that are thinking about it. And we've, of course, seen a huge, huge influx of people and cash on this topic in the past few years, but still it's it is still a small number of people. Small, especially yeah. in Europe, I think. Um, and and Mark's group has really, um, I don't know, galvanized quite a group of people to to enter this, this space. Is, so. is, is Mark's group perhaps a little bit like um, uh, any big, um, well-funded Silicon Valley firm that spawns a bunch of new entrepreneurs? <laughs> I don't think they think of it this way at all, but then I don't think that's the case either. But uh, that, that group now is a company in its own right. It's called Mosameet. They've recently received a large you know, amount of funding to yeah. open up their pilot plant facility. So they're also really trending towards um, some exciting progress in the field Okay. in their, in their own sort of way. Right okay. What about you? Did you need VC funding or not? You bootstrapped yourself completely, right? We just concentrate on producing and delivering and making people happy. Okay. You know, um, of course, it would be great to um, uh, find a way to scale up, and, uh, but we still, you know, we make everything ourselves. We package it ourselves. We deliver it ourselves, um, and so um, that way we can maintain. Uh, uh, Control over quality, and we get to know our customers, and we can ask them, you know, what uh, what they think about the products. Um, but of course, um, an investment or being able to scale up would be awesome. Yeah, guys, next slide, please. So, which markets are most promising for food tech startups? Yeah, so this is the um, this is the uh, hmm, geographic location uh, slide that uh, I wanted to see. Um, Dan, um, why did you choose to start in Europe? Um, because you're from here, you understand it, or it, and 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 what? Where do you see demand going in uh, the US and in Asia? Is one behind the other? It's a. I, I started here in Europe because I'm Dutch. Uh, I had my network here, uh, and. I, 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 Europe has a lot to offer when it comes to knowledge, university collaborations, already existing food uh, companies and food culture, where this was a pretty good place to get started. And uh, we, all, we for now, we only have uh, European investors, uh, which for our our type of work is pretty unique, and we were very happy with that. This is also probably reflected, as you see on the uh, on the slide you have in front of you, that uh, really this the the food uh, VC market is picking up greatly in the in Europe. Um, to say as a, as a market to launch, I'm not so sure. There are pros and cons to every jurisdiction where you're launching, um, and you don't necessarily have to make the choice right now until you reach market. So we're keeping our eyes open and uh, luckily money doesn't know uh, borders. So you can go to the States and do a fundraise there. You can go to Asia and do a fundraise there. Uh, you can talk to every jurisdiction to start working on regulatory frameworks, to start to market entry. So this is, it's not necessarily that you are in Europe, that it means that you're bound to Europe. And I think that's, that's very important to know. Yeah. Freya, as a scientist, um, do you think the connection between the COVID pandemic and 
um, meat consumption in Asian markets. And, and looking at this um, huge decrease in VC investment in Asia, do you think this is a do you think this is it's, there's, there's a connection here at all? And um, do you feel there's a huge opportunity? I mean, if I was a VC, Asia would look really interesting right now. So I think a really important thing when we're talking about the current pandemic situation is to not focus so much on the fact that it was first sort of isolated and, and became widespread uh, in Asia. I think that this, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's just difficult to say where this comes from, right? Um, but I think indeed the food production system was a huge part of it and continues to be. So not only do you see a huge number of cases from wet markets in, in, uh, in China, but you also see continuing you know, loci of infection that are coming from slaughterhouses, from meatpacking facilities. Um, here in Germany, the worst outbreak so far occurred in a, a huge uh, slaughterhouse, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and in, I think, in good to slow. Sorry? In good to slow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think like uh, it really highlights that keeping so many animals in close proximity with so many humans mm -hmm. uh, is a huge, huge health risk potential. Doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think you're going to keep, I mean, we already have seen like huge, um, you know, health risks that have come from animal production. Classic is H1N1 also from, you know, uh, swine and um, yeah, I think there's there's always going to be this, this risk and it really shows how much potential there is to avoid it by changing the way we that our food system works. Yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity there. But I think on the, the topic of uh, mm -hmm. VC investment from from Asia, I think, as, as Dan was mentioning, it's also really important to consider that these regulatory markets are changing dramatically around the world. And I think uh, there's a great arguments to be made for the current regulatory landscape in Asia being, I mean, not to make a monolith of all of Asia, but uh, but, but being even more favorable for sort of novel biotechnology applications for food. So I think, you know, just showing the VC investment in the past two years doesn't necessarily show the whole picture. Maybe there's actually much more opportunity uh, in, in these markets that we show a small decline right now uh, than we realized. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, next slide, guys. Greenhouse gas emissions in livestock. Mm. Okay. So, um, current meat system, um, is it really that bad? Um, and what's the biggest drivers? Um, Freya, how is the environmental, how's the environmental impact of cultured meat? Um, energy and labs. So Dan's doing his work. What's he doing to the planet? Also, it's, I mean, it's hard to uh, to know exactly what the impacts are right now, because as we, we know, culture meat is really at a small scale and how that scales up is going to change dramatically. Of course, it'll take more energy to produce what you want to produce if you have it at a large scale, but it'll be a much more efficient process. And it can be difficult to predict these things at this point. Um, I think a really, really important thing to remember, though, is that the, the way that our energy infrastructure is built dramatically changes how different sectors are able to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. So a, a great example is a paper that came out a couple of years ago that was describing that if we were to, even if we were to switch to a completely uh, animal free um, food production system right now with our current uh, energy production methods, which are very like carbon intensive, uh, we wouldn't actually help ourselves that much. So it really shows that there needs to be a synergy between um, you know, sustainable and environmentally friendly efforts uh, across the board. It, this, as, as Don mentioned, cultured meat is not just a silver bullet. It exists uh, as a synthesis with lots of other factors. Sure. David, um, envir environmental impact on your products. Um, so how transparent is the value chain for vegan alternatives in general? Um, and I know you're a small producer, but if you could just Imagine you were maybe 10 times or even 100 times bigger. Um, um, and uh, so for other products in the market as well, so soya farming, for instance, could you, could you talk about that a little bit? Well, of course, there's the, uh, the misconception that um, the soy farming is, um, you know, people talk about soy products um, from a certain segment of the of the population get this uh, whole thing. Well, yeah, but soy is you know it's this they're you know taking burning down the rainforest to grow soy, but they don't realize that the, that's all most exclusively uh, for livestock um, food. And um, so I mean, we use uh, exclusively European um, soy, uh, certified GMO free, um, 
that's um, we try to um, guarantee the highest quality product. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, the main thing for us is, in which we had with the slide before um, earlier, was um, you can just see how much um, smaller the footprint is when you have a plant-based or protein product in terms of water, in terms of everything, basically. Um, and so, um, I mean, that's 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 our main focus: keep our footprint small. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Dan, um, so um, can this be a driver for consumers to change their buying behavior or do you have to manage to produce for a very low price to compete? I, I think it's, it's not one dimensional that people make their choices. Um, I think the most the three biggest drivers will be taste. If you make a product that doesn't taste right, people won't buy it. It is availability, so skill. Yeah. So it's not available enough, then it's, it's going to be hard to, to get people to try it all over the world. Uh, and it's cost. So if it's too costly, then people won't be able to buy it uh, or think it's too expensive. And of course, um, environmental things will help with that. If you can say, well, this is better for the environment, people like Frey already told uh, told us just a moment ago, are willing to pay a little bit more, but it cannot be an exuberant amount. It has to be within bounds that people can afford food. Um, and I think you can, the environmental impact or the environmental story can help, but it will not be the uh, the most convincing arm argument at the end of the day. Do you think um, governments can help in this respect? Um, as a new producer of meat, could you ever imagine there being a, a meat tax on traditional meat? Oh, uh, of course I can imagine that. I think people have been uh, floating that idea around for a while now, but to get that across as legislation, I think that's a, a different story. It will be much harder, but um, like you see with electric cars, if you subsidize or if you entice people to, to do certain, to promote certain behavior, people are susceptible to that. Um, so I can definitely see a role of government and also to say that already government is helping us. The European Union has granted us uh, a grant which we're using to do innovation. The Dutch government is helping us uh, with promoting the idea across the borders. So there's already a change of mindset inside of government that they realize that this is something that has to happen. And in the Netherlands, we have a, a program called the, the National Protein Transition, where they are thinking of new ways of producing high quality protein. Uh, where cultured meat is definitely named as a uh, as a uh, as a subject of, of interest uh, that should be supported. So we have a closing question. So we, we, we're we're coming up to the hour pretty soon, um, uh, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, Dan, Freya, is it possible to create dinosaur meat um, or a top wagyu steak through cultured meat technology? Yeah, I mean, that's the goal, right? Uh, it's, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, well, I mean, in terms of, uh, in, you can grow whatever animal you'd like in a lab, and there have been some folks uh, at Harvard even who are trying to grow some woolly mammoth. Uh, so uh, basically, if you can get some cells from something, you can you can grow it. Uh, but in so we have a very imaginative way of, of viewing how food looks in the future, and it could very well include uh, more unconventional meat sources or mixes of animals or uh, whatever you want to imagine. But I think the, the second question was high high quality Wagyu. This is really what we want to want to get at in the end, right? Mm -hmm. Because these heterogeneous tissues that have fat and muscle together that are the highest meat quality, the sort of uh, advantage of cultured meat is that you don't need to just take one tiny part of a cow that is this highly coveted piece, or you don't need this one particular breed that's highly coveted. Or just the fin from a shark. Just the fin from a shark. You can yeah. make just fin only yeah. without ever harming a shark. Or yeah. just Wagyu nice. steak only without ever, uh, you know, actually hurting a cow. So yeah. I think that really gets to a huge, huge advantage is that high quality meat products could be much more widely available and accessible than they are currently. Yeah. Very good. So guys, um, this has been great. Um, we have some questions. I'm looking over there at the production box. Thumbs up, we have some questions. So why don't you get them on the screen? Right, so from Jakob Grabowski, um, apologies Jakob for um, not pronouncing your name correctly. 
Do you think there's still a lot of educating that needs to be done in the cell ag industry? I guess this is more for Dan to get more people to be open to the idea of lab grown meat. If so, how are you planning to do this? So, um, first off, yes, of course, in any new food type, you need education. Uh, if you're not transparent in food, people think the worst. Uh, th that's just how it unfortunately is, and it's a good right to think that, since it's always, you know, you put it in your body, it's very cultural, it's very emotional. Food is, is a very special place in our society, and if you're telling people that your product is good and delicious, you have to show them why. So I do think that it is our job to... Um, show to people that this is perfectly healthy, safe alternative for, for normal meat. And the way I'm doing that, well, uh, by things like this, I'm here now telling you how uh, this is coming and that is completely safe. And if we're making sure it's gonna be delicious, this is the way how we are trying to educate people by doing the interaction, answering these questions, being on panels. Uh, unfortunately, with the current situation, I cannot be uh, local, but I, if, if this thing uh, goes over, I will definitely be in Munich together with you guys and doing the same, telling you the same story. Very good, next question, please. Avni Jane, so um, what would be the tipping point for this technology in the market? Freya, maybe you should answer that. What's gonna get people buying um, cultured meat? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Don really got into it earlier. It's mm. it's price parity. That's mm. a that's a big thing, um, and uh, taste. Yeah, truly, and and anything on top of that is is additional. But is the question for the development of the technology, or is it more in the direction of uh, what actual technological steps need to be achieved? Yeah, I mean, Dave, David, your first tr tryouts with um, with your products. Um, how did they go? I mean, who did you test them on? Was it Silka or me? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that was um, open to, to uh, trying them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you feel that there was, had you invested in technology to produce this stuff? I mean, I remember seeing some sort of lab, some sort of kitchen lab. Yeah, but I mean, I'm, I love to cook and I love to enjoy food and I was focusing on just getting maximum enjoyment out of the product and I leave the science to, to uh, you know, scientists and you know, people that are, are sure. sure. Next question, please, guys. CJ, um, meat and especially innards. Okay, being English, that's something we love to eat, kidneys, liver. Uh, have a very high micronutrient level. Is it possible to produce the same good nutrients? And if so, will it be healthy for our bodies? Damn. So the, the thing that we, of course, are, are focusing on at the moment is uh, is meat, so not the innards. And what you can see, what what, the, what is so nice about this technology is that when you're when you're using this technology, you have suddenly a much bigger control over your process. You know, you can you can feed a cow grain, you can feed them grass, you can feed them only a limited amount of uh, products that they can actually digest. But in our case, we can give the cells the raw building materials which you need to produce the, the meat. So we can adjust all the nutrient profiles of our meat to specifically be good or beneficial to the people that actually eat it. Can you imagine, for example, extra vitamin D, like in the Netherlands currently is a pretty dreadful day. So sometimes we can use a little bit extra vitamin D in our meat. And in this way, even enhance meat and uh, make it more healthy, get out the, sa the saturated fats, uh, really taking control over a food product, which at the moment has been uh, a standard and don't, don't even we don't even know most of the time what the nutrient profile of our meat is it just says animal meat at the back and we don't know actually what's in it so this way i think we can create a new paradigm where we are saying okay so this is the type of nutrients from our meat that we want to have and make it more healthier per, per person than it is at the moment you're not really having an agreement there yes yeah, can, can, could you is it possible <laughs> to, produce a, to produce a liver or a kidney? Yeah, I mean, this or, is, a lung, or a lung. I think it's really important to, to remember that that culture meat comes from the biomedical field. So yeah. a lot of the learnings that we're applying from you know decades of research are coming from our attempts to grow 
different sorts of tissues like mm. lungs or kidneys that a human might want to have implanted in them instead of waiting, you know, decades for a donor. So that's really the foundation of the technology. So definitely you could you could grow whatever parts of the meat that you like and it comes back again to this idea of of like diversity and there's so much the huge diversity of the food culture. Yeah. And you can one hundred percent access those parts, even the parts that we and uh, are not necessarily focusing on right now, which is muscle. Yeah. So lots of English and French people will be delighted that their, <laughs> their, their foie gras wasn't made um, by a goose, but was actually made in a lab. Yeah, there's actually a couple of uh, companies that are expressly doing foie gras, and yeah. uh, I think it's a great, great angle, definitely. Yeah, interesting. Good. Um, Matthew, um, who's this guy? Part of the taste of the meat comes from the fat. The artificial meat will have none. How do you solve that? Well, that that's a, that's a false statement. <laughs> so that, that's the way I could solve this. Is we will have fat in it, of course. Since if you're looking at the uh, the profile of in of the of, of muscle tissue, it is almost eighty to ninety percent, depending on where you're taking it from, uh, is muscle tissue. But then there is an eight to nine percent fat content, and then the rest of it is uh, other cells like. Um, fibroblasts or any other cell type that is supporting the muscle tissue and its function. So we will for sure have fat cells, especially if you want to go into high quality meats like Wagyu, it is as a high fat percentage. So we definitely will make sure and we are making sure that this will contain fat and fat cells. Very good. And actually a pretty fascinating uh, sort of angle for some startups in the cultured meat space are actually focusing expressly on fat and their goal is to create sort of mm. hybrid products where they sell their just cell-based fat, so just animal fat, to plant-based meat producers. So then you have this, you know, this beautiful like Boonian uh, plant-based protein with animal fats integrated. And I think hybrid products like this are, are really important for this protein transition that we're talking about. And I think this is another example of how the two fields are really complementing each other and synergistic. And it's not really an either or situation so much as a both and. When you make this, David, do you do you put when you produce this? Do you put fat into this at all? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you have to. I mean, right. fat is also a uh, a taste uh, carrier, a flavor carrier. And, okay. Um, so, um, of course, we. But it's still. I mean, it's very lean. It's, it's not such fatty. Fat. It's, um, yeah. you know. Ah. Mr. Lapidar, good. So, question, maybe a stupid question. No, no questions are stupid, they're all valid. But as an interested hobby cook, would it be possible to develop a homegrown steak kit like home brewing kits exist? Dan, how can you, min can you miniaturize what you're doing? I, I, to be fair, I wouldn't know. So what I'm uh, focusing on is really starting to develop pilot plans and large scale factories. So this is where most of my time and energy is devoted to. Uh, and all those things have to be very large and uh, very automated. So um, I, I don't foresee a future where this, at least for, for our uh, organization, where we go into this, but who knows what other people or players in the field might do. Hans, there's a great organization called the Shojin Meat Project based in Japan, and their goal was to allow sort of citizen scientists to get their hands dirty in the cultured meat space. And they made some really nice uh, sort of magazines that are describing the process of how you can hack your kitchen to make it a place where you could grow meat. And of course, this is a very uh, sort of low efficiency uh, process, but um, definitely one that could be perhaps attainable in your kitchen. And yeah. I guess we can share this this resource later. I think it's a really a really nice one. Very cool, David. Is it possible to miniaturize Boonian? Could you imagine Boonian at home? Of course. I mean, we, we, are, we try to make it that uh, that you know we say if if all the ingredients are ingredients that your grandma would know, you know. And mm. so um, I mean, it's this is basically it started in my kitchen at home before I moved to more of an industrial. Or a larger restaurant kitchen to, to produce. Um, of course, it started at home with things that you have in your kitchen. So. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question, Hans. Um, next question, please. So, Julian, um, following the question of Madalena, uh, whoever, Mad yeah, Madalena is probably coming after this. How do you evaluate the potential for human health 
if disease-causing substances in meat can be identified and del deliberately left out of the production of alternative products? Yeah, that's a big question, right? How do you evaluate the potential for human health if you can actually reduce the damage that meat consumption does to the body? Well, it, it, um, maybe I'm not, not understanding the question correctly, but it, it seems like it's self-explanatory, right? If you're eating a substance which normally causes uh, heart and uh, valve diseases, and you're seeing a decrease of that when the introductory of this product, then I would think that it would, would answer the question. And we know from normal dietary studies that certain substances cause a specific type of pathology. So if you would leave them out, it, I would assume that that would stop the pathology from occurring as a whole. Any comments? Yeah, I agree. That's it. Okay. So uh, we've got one more question. Let's have that up. Julian, how hard is the pushback from the established meat industry and their lobby as of today? And we do actually have some people from that business um, in the audience tonight. So did you did you feel the anger of local Bavarian meat producers when you started doing it? Did they ever you say, what the hell are you doing? I mean, you were a big garden manager, right? Yeah. You know um, these people. Well, you'd get certain looks, you know, um, um, but um, it's mostly just like a con confused look in their eye. They just couldn't quite get their head around that somebody would want to try to make this, a, a plant-based yeah. protein product <laughs> and just didn't fit into their, uh, you know, paradigm sure. at all. So, um, but mostly you just got a lot of, um, you know, from people that are, were used to eating meat with just a huge amount of skepticism at mm -hmm. the beginning. And you've seen that change now. It's, it's a, it's a different world than it was eight years ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, it really, things have changed dramatically. Yeah. Absolutely. Dan, are you going to be bought by a giant meat producer and put in a warehouse somewhere to die? That is that's definitely not the plan. Um, we do see already um, bigger meat producing companies or protein producing companies uh, looking at this uh, emerging field quite intensely. And some of them already has made bets. Uh, so instead of being disruptive, they want to be part of the disruption. Um, I think from the established uh, some some establishments uh, we can see a little bit of 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 caution and saying okay what's going on here but they would rather keep a close eye on us and being part of it instead of being the ones that are getting disrupted and I think that is the reason behind that is you can already see that if you look at the growth of their fields and the impact that it has that they're they're not they're not a, a, you know blind to this. Uh, they're not blind to the public perception and the public pushback that we're having on these types of practices. So I think they are ready for a change and uh, it would be great if, of course, we, they can help us with that. Ever been followed home by men in black suits? Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, yeah, again, really spot on. And uh, another thing that's important to remember is that the, the sort of big players in this field are that they have their own financial interests at heart. And there will for sure be people who could lose out. For example, a farmer doesn't have the same uh, sort of interests that Tyson or Cargill as an entire corporation mm -hmm. does. And uh, it's maybe important to realize that exactly by, diversi by, di by diversifying their portfolios, um, these big companies are be part of the, the, the progress rather than disrupted by it. And maybe mm -hmm. it leaves certain people in the dust, but certainly it doesn't leave these large meat producers in the Yeah, well, it's corporate collaboration, right? So that's something that we um, we are experts in. So we're experts in helping corporates overcome these sorts of challenges. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, good. Well, I think we finished tonight. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Freya. Thanks so much. Dan, it's great to see you there. David, as always. Um, my name's Garen Goodman. Um, I work for Striber, we build ventures, and we can build meat ventures. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.